for them to erect a temple and shrines to their god Pan. And so that's what they did, and they changed the name to Panias. Well, when the Romans came along and turfed out the Greeks, they put up a temple to Jupiter in exactly the same location. So you had one layer of demonic activity laid down upon another. When Herod the Great died, his empire, if you will, his kingdom, was divided up by the Romans between his four sons. One of them, Herod Philip, inherited the Golan Heights. And he erected yet another temple in honor of the emperor himself and renamed it Caesarea after the emperor, Philippi after himself. And that's how we know it in Matthew 18. Caesarea Philippi. The point I want to make, however, is that you would never find a more evil place on the planet than Caesarea Philippi. Lair upon lair of evil religion. And yet, it's here that the Lord Jesus deliberately invites Peter to share what amounts to pure revelation from heaven concerning himself. Now, why do it there? Well, it seems clear to me that it was the very best place to do it. This supreme revelation about the Lord Jesus revealed in such an evil place to encourage all of us. Some of you may live in towns that are dominated by Islam. Some of you may live in situations where you're severely discouraged from testifying about Jesus. You say, well, <laughs> If only I lived somewhere else, things would be different and I'd be able to speak of Jesus far more readily. But you don't understand where I am. I'm surrounded by people who don't love Jesus and who would be mortally offended if I spoke about him. Well, I want to say to those of you who feel that way, don't feel that way. Because he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And if heaven can reveal supreme revelation about Jesus in Caesarea Philippi, believe me, heaven can reveal that revelation through you wherever you may happen to be. So let's have a look and see what we're dealing with here. This is Matthew chapter 18. Sorry, it isn't. It's Matthew chapter 16. And we're going in at verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, well, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now I have to come clean straight away because some of you will be scratching your heads and thinking, that doesn't sound like the King James Version to me. And you'd be absolutely right. It is the nearly infallible version, or the nasty inadequate version, depending on your point of view. It is the NIV, the New International Version. Why on earth am I using it? Well, simply because in all the churches where I go, that's the one they seem to have in their seats already. So if I use a different translation, some of them are floundering all over the place. So I trust this doesn't offend anybody, but this is the version I'm going to use. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Well, what about you, said the Lord Jesus? Who do you say I am? It was Simon Peter who answered, you're the Messiah the Son of the Living God. Isn't that wonderful? You're the Messiah. No, I don't need to ask you, do I, what the word Messiah means, but perhaps I will, just in case. What does it mean? Anointed one, absolutely. Who did they anoint in Bible times? Kings and priests, absolutely. absolutely. So what's this saying about the Lord Jesus? He is the King of Kings. He is our great High Priest. Hallelujah. What a wonderful thing for heaven to reveal 
through the mouth of the Apostle Peter. I find that extraordinary. And to reveal it in such an unlikely place. Miracle upon miracle, isn't it? You're the Messiah. But then he adds, the Son of the living God. So heaven is not content simply to say, the Lord Jesus is the King of Kings. He is the great high priest, the one who would allow himself to be sacrificed on that Roman crucifying stake, to shed his own precious blood as our great high priest, to take away sins and to give us his own special precious righteousness. Isn't that a tremendous thing? That's who our great high priest is. The son of the living God, this is a statement of divinity. It pushes it even further. So this is the majestic hugeness of the revelation that came through the Apostle Peter. What an amazing thing. And Jesus responded to him, Blessed are you, <clears throat> Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Peter couldn't have worked it out for himself, could he? It had to be revelation. It was revelation. It came. Praise the Lord for that. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. So you see, that's where we're going with this. This is the very first reference to church in the scriptures. And it comes out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus himself is the first mention of church. And this, therefore, is a very significant and important reference because Jesus is going to say something about the church that he will build that should not escape our attention. This is critically important. And the first mention of something in the Bible will always set a kind of keynote for every other reference to it. So what this tells us about church in the mouth of the Lord Jesus should stand us in very good stead if we're going to understand what church is really all about, according to our Savior. He says, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The name Peter, Kepha in Hebrew, Petros in Greek, is a diminutive form of the word for stone or rock. It means a little rock, piece of grit, you could say, or a small pebble, something like that. That's the name. That's what it is. Who gave him the nickname? We're not entirely sure, but it might even have been the Lord Jesus. But I guess whoever gave him that nickname did so for a good reason. If it means a little piece of grit, seems to me that it might have something to do with being irritable. <laughs> Can you imagine how irritating it would be to have a piece of grit under your foot, but inside the sandal? How irritating that would be. Well, maybe that's why he was given that name, because we know from the text of the Gospels that Peter could be very irritable at times. And even the Lord Jesus, I'm sure, found him irritable from time to time. And there's a, an interesting reference to that a few verses after the passage I'm going to be reading where Jesus is telling about his coming suffering in Jerusalem and being killed and his subsequent being raised to life. And we're told in verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, Follow behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. How easily, dear Peter, could turn from being a vehicle of divine revelation to a vehicle of demonic revelation, such that the Lord Jesus has to rebuke him. Stop it, Satan. Get behind me. And this therefore reveals the duplicity in the Apostle Peter. Quite an extraordinary change of mood here in Matthew 18. But let's go back to where we were. I tell you that you are Peter, 
the diminutive form of the word. And on this rock, I will build my church. Now, the word rock there is the word in Greek, Petra. You're familiar with that, aren't you? Because it's an interesting place in Jordan. Anybody been there? Petra? Good. What do you notice about Petra? What is its special feature? The rock, the red rock city half as old as time, as the poet put it. But it's carved out of solid mountain. The canyon of Petra is absolutely amazing. Temples, all kinds of necropolises, if that's the right way to put it, Roman theater, all kinds of things carved out of solid rock. But that's the contrast Jesus is making here. Petros, tiny stone. Petra, mighty rock. You could call a mountain Petra, and it wouldn't be inappropriate. So here's a contrast. What does he mean? You are Peter, Petros, and on this rock, I will build my church. Now, as you know, and we've been hearing quite a bit about the Roman Catholic Church at this conference, for the Roman Catholics, they believe that Peter is the rock on which Jesus would build his church. As if that's what Jesus said here. Well, as you can clearly see, it is not what he said here. You are Petros, the miniature form. And on this mighty rock, I will build my church. So has that nothing to do with the Apostle Peter? No, I believe it has something to do with the Apostle Peter. It's what the Apostle Peter said under inspiration of heaven. You, Lord Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the King of Kings. You are the Great High Priest. You are God the Son. Now that is the great statement. And Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. Everything we have been saying today and last night has been to buttress that statement. The rock, the church that Jesus builds, is on the foundation of Jesus. The Messiah, the King of Kings, God the Son, that is the foundation of the church. When I spoke this morning, I referred to one of the great old hymns that we used to have trotted out in high days and holidays in the cathedral in Salisbury. Christ is made the sure foundation. What a statement that is. But you see, this is the foundation that heaven has laid. This is a foundation and no other foundation can be laid than that which is laid. Jesus the Messiah. Praise the Lord. Now nothing could be clearer than that. The foundation of the church that Jesus builds is Jesus and nothing else. Nothing denominational, nothing man-made, only what heaven reveals about the glorious Savior. He is the foundation of his church. But he says something about it which is simply extraordinary. Bear in mind, this is the first mention of church Highly significant, therefore. So what's he now saying? I will build my church and the gates of Hades, it says here. Well, the word is Hellas, and it really is the gates of hell. Will not overcome it, and that can also mean will not prove stronger than it. Now, in the days of paganism, when the god Pan was worshipped at Caesarea Philippi, Panias as they called it, and during the Roman time when Jupiter was worshipped there, they recognized a particular cave right there at Caesarea Philippi, a big cave, out of which used to pour a huge cascading torrent. It came up out of the ground under Mount Hermon and cascaded down to form the Banyas River, one of the tributary rivers of the Jordan, a very important river. And it still flows, but it comes out underneath now. It doesn't flow like a great torrent out of the cavern. But it did 
and they associated it with demonic activity. They worshipped demons there quite openly, and they believed that it was a portal into the underworld. That's what they believed, through which evil spirits came, and back into which evil spirits went. And they called it the gates of hell. Isn't that fascinating? That the Lord Jesus picks up on that, and he actually says of his church, the gates of hell will not overcome it or be able to withstand it. See, that's attack and defense. This is fighting talk, isn't it? And this is what Jesus says about his church. The church he is building. What are its main features? They are associated with spiritual warfare. Attack and defense. He promises here that the authorities of hell, because that's what the word gates implies here, let me just backtrack, in biblical times, if you wanted a judgment on any matter and wanted to seek out a judgment by a judge, or if it was an important city by the king, you would go to the gate of the city where you would find a cathedra, a big stone throne in which the king or the judge would come from time to time and you could plead your case and he would make a judgment. One of the places we visit on our tours, not far from Caesarea Philippi, is Tel Dan. And Tel Dan is a fantastic place to visit. Not only because it's the location of Jeroboam's altar, which we visit and obviously talk about, but there is a very, very ancient gateway there in which there is a cathedra a stone throne, and you can actually see one, exactly what's being described here. The authorities, that's what the word gate stands for, the king or judges, the authorities. So when you see the phrase gates of hell, think of authorities of hell. Because if you think of gates, it's a bit confusing, isn't it? Because when you were on your way here, when you got out of the car, and walked towards this place, if you passed a gate, would it have surprised you if it rose up off its hinges and started clattering you around the head? Well, gates don't do that kind of thing, do they? They tend to be pretty passive, really. You operate them. Nothing passive about the authorities of hell. This is warfare Jesus is talking about. But how thrilling that he says, the authorities of hell cannot hold out against my church when my church is plundering its goods and the authorities of hell cannot overcome my church when they are attacking my church. Now those are tremendous promises and they have entirely to do with spiritual warfare. So this is why I wrote a little book entitled Built for Battle because that's the purpose that Jesus has for his church. We are built for battle. I referred to a battleship last night, didn't I? A battle cruiser. And how we'd all much rather be on a pleasure cruiser. But we can't have it that way. We are built for battle. That's what Jesus is doing. And we best get used to the idea. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And the word you there is very surprisingly in the singular. Now you might expect that when the Roman Catholics say Peter was given the keys of the kingdom of heaven, oh no, 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 we say that can't be right. Now he gave the keys of the kingdom to his whole church. But here Jesus is singling out Peter and saying, I will give you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now this is very interesting. When did Peter use the keys of the kingdom? Bearing in mind that keys are used for unlocking things. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So here is Peter unlocking the kingdom of heaven in several situations. Notice the plural. 
I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. When did Peter apply a key to the kingdom, insert it in a lock, and turn it, plunk, and see the door swing open, and men and women enter the kingdom? When did he do it? The day of Pentecost. Very good. And who were those that responded when he opened up the door through preaching the gospel? They were entirely Jewish people. It being the Feast of Pentecost. One of the three pilgrim feasts. Hallelujah. Key number one. This mighty evangelist Peter paving the way for all those disciples of Jesus who would follow in his train. But he's the one that was privileged initiating it. Now here's a much more tough one. Where was the second key applied? Pardon? No, that's the third. Well done. Where's the toughie, the second one? Samaria. Some would say to Samaria. They would indeed, and I'd be among them. <laughs> you remember what happened. <clears throat> Philip went up to Samaria and preached. But there was something about his gospel message that was defective and had to be corrected. And when the saints in Jerusalem got to hear about it, they sent Peter and John up to Samaria as a matter of utmost urgency to complete the gospel preaching that Philip had begun. Peter was the one who did it. And it was to the Samaritans. Do you remember? He went to the Samaritans and he preached and declared the reality of the ministry of the Spirit. And they were thoroughly born again. Hallelujah. That was the second key. The third key? Cornelius. And Cornelius was not Jewish, was he? How do we know that? Well, we're told he was a centurion. He didn't have any Jewish centurions. But his name gives him away, doesn't it? Cornelius. That's a good old Roman name. Who was it that preached the gospel to Cornelius? Peter. Did he do it willingly? Well, not really. He did it most unwillingly. Because when he was up on that rooftop in the house of Simon the Tanner, down in Joppa, he had a vision from the Lord. A vision of clean and unclean animals, and the Lord said to Peter, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter was shocked beyond words. Nothing unclean has ever entered my mouth, he said. In other words, you must have made a mistake, Lord. But the Lord didn't. He wasn't there by sanctioning eating rats and mice and snakes and all things like that. Not at all. But he was making a powerful, powerful case. That, Corny, that Peter should not call anything unclean which the Lord was going to call clean. Now what's interesting about the account is this. I don't know whether you've ever considered this, but we all know that Peter was very, very conservative in his Jewishness. Came from Galilee, hotbed of zealot activity, and we believe that Peter had been a zealot at some stage. What's the clue for believing that? Garden of Gethsemane. What happened? He did. Peter had a, a sword under his clothes. It was a dagger. It was a stiletto, an assassin's weapon, actually. Exactly the sort of thing that zealots would carry when they came to Rome, knowing that there was an augmented garrison in Rome, and they expected trouble. So this is the case. Peter is a real tough guy but he was a very religious guy he knew the gospel was only for the jews now he's had a bit of a shock in understanding that samaritans could receive the gospel but let's be honest samaritans were only a nudge away from the jews not that far away at all so he could just about cope with that revelation i suppose but what's going on now? The interesting thing is, where was he staying in Joppa, or Jaffa, as we call it today? Simon. Whose house? Simon. Simon what? Simon. The tenor. What does that tell you? 
It was an unclean trade. What was Simon Peter doing in the house, staying in the house of Simon the Tanner? Not a thing you'd expect a Jewish man to do at all, because it would make him ritually unclean as well as Simon the Tanner if he was to stay under his roof. Fascinating thing, isn't it? You can see how the Lord is softening Peter up for a revelation that was going to completely overwhelm him. No sooner had he seen these animals and heard the Lord say, kill and eat, and the sheep was taken up again, so he didn't actually have to kill and eat anything. But suddenly, there's a racket at the door. It's messengers from Cornelius. Peter goes up to Caesarea by the sea, not Caesarea, uh, Philippi this time, but Caesarea by the sea, Caesarea Maritima, and it's Cornelius' messengers. And he goes up, and you remember what happens. He starts to preach the gospel. When he's nicely launched into his gospel presentation, the Holy Spirit responds, falls on the company, and they get baptized in the Holy Spirit just the same way that the Holy Spirit had baptized the apostles on the day of Pentecost. So you see what's happening here. The Jews in Jerusalem, the Samaritans, and then the wider Roman world. Now that's fascinating to me, because if you turn to Acts, Acts chapter 1, you read something quite astonishing, which seems to fit this perfectly. This is verse 6. When they met together, the apostles asked the Lord Jesus, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And the Lord said to them, that is the most ridiculous question anybody ever asked me. What on earth has Israel got to do with anything now? Is that what you have in your Bible? Even the NIV hasn't got that. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom, of, the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. What's that telling us? It's telling us that the Father has set a time and a date when the kingdom is going to be restored to Israel. Hallelujah. That's in Father's agenda according to the Lord Jesus. Then he goes on, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem and in all Judea, the area around Jerusalem, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Roman Empire. Now isn't that amazing? That Jesus here lays down his mandate for his apostles and they fulfill his wish precisely and it's Peter that takes the initiative in every instance to the Jews in Jerusalem and Judea to the Samaritans and to the Roman world. I find that wonderful. But you see, this is the strategy of Jesus for his church that he will build. Evangelism at the heart of it. But notice, it is warfare all the way. And that's the part that we don't want to hear. But it's the part that we have to hear. Because warfare is something that chooses you. You don't choose it. Have you noticed that? My dad was a sergeant major in the Royal Artillery during the Second World War. He was a, a distinguished soldier, but he didn't want to go. There wasn't a day, this may surprise you, but there wasn't a day when the King, George VI, and Winston Churchill came to my front door as a little boy, rapping on the door, and when my dad went to the door of the house, the king said to him, Now, Ernie, he would do, because that was my father's name, Ernie, the Prime Minister and I have made a decision, and we are now at war with Nazi Germany, 
but I need you to sanction our decision. Now that was a privileged thing for my father to hear, wasn't it? That the king wouldn't be able to go to war against Nazi Germany unless my dad gave the say so. Of course it didn't happen, did it? He wasn't consulted, he didn't need to be. Because he was a citizen of this country and therefore war chose him. Now in the case of my dad, he was a distinguished fighting man, but he could have been a conscientious objector. Let me tell you this, in the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there are no conscientious objectives. We are all in it, and we are all right in it. We're not in it a little bit. Satan is not saying to you, well, I'm going to go easy on you. Oh, I'll attack people like Jacob Prash. He's a thorn in my sight. Of course I'm going to attack him. But you be nice to me and I'll give you an easy time. Let me tell you this. He's not out for giving you an easy time. He is quite literally out for giving you a hell of a time. And if you don't learn to fight, you're going to be defeated. That's the option. There is no other. Fight or be defeated. And we take the authority that Jesus gives to attack the enemy as well as to defend ourselves. Now this is critically important. We must come to terms with the fact that we are a church at war all the time. Jesus then goes on in Matthew 16, 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There have been some mighty strange sermons preached on that verse, getting people to suppose that they have all kinds of authority to bind and loose. Well, let's just be careful here. And I find the NIV very helpful at this point. Because there's a footnote here. It says this, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven should actually be whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Now see, that's radically different. Because the initiative is not with the church of Jesus. The initiative is with heaven itself. The blessed Holy Spirit is where the initiative is and he makes his intentions known to his church and we implement here on the earth what has already been established in heaven. Now that is critically important. Let us understand the authority we have is not our authority, it is the authority of heaven let loose in the body of Christ. You remember, well, you won't remember, you're not old enough, but you know about the, the centurion that came to Jesus on behalf of his servant, don't you? You remember that, reading about it? And he said to the Lord Jesus, he said, you just say the word and my servant will be healed. Uh, why did he say that? What did he go on to say? For I am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to this man, do this, and he does it, and to my servant, go over there, and he'll go over there. Well, yeah, not quite that, though, is it? Because what he said to Jesus was, not I am a man set under authority. I also am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goes. And to this man, do this, and he does it. And how did Jesus respond? I haven't found faith like that in the whole of Israel. Now can you imagine how the Jewish people in Capernaum responded to that? Not well. But the fact is, that centurion recognized something about Jesus which was profound. See, in the same way that when the centurion said to one of his legionaries, do this or go there, it was as if the centurion was speaking with all the authority of Caesar. 
And if the legionary dared disobey, the whole might of Rome would have fallen on his head. And he'd have lost his head straight away. Now when he said, I also, you see what he's saying to Jesus. I recognize that you, Lord Jesus, are utterly under the authority of your Father. And when you, when you say this or that, if you were to say for my servant, be healed, I know that he would be because you have all the authority of heaven behind you. Now that is faith, you see. And that's what Jesus was recognizing in this guy. But you notice it's the authority of heaven itself that he's recognizing, pouring through the divine Son. All the authority of heaven is at his fingertips, you might say. And the centurion recognized it. But we need to recognize it too. That whatever we engage in in this world, when we are using the gifts of the Holy Spirit to release people from demons, or to heal the sick, or to raise the dead, or to provide words of knowledge, or words of wisdom, or words of prophecy, to crack people's lives open and bless them and release them, the initiative is always in heaven. Always. And let me ask you this. How do you know when heaven is sanctioning something. Because the Bible is what confirms it. Heaven only speaks according to the written word of God. Hallelujah. So therefore, we are men and women primarily of the word and the spirit. And it is the Word of God which reveals continually what the mind of God is. And we take the written Word of God and we apply it under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And praise God, heaven will always have its way. But I find that so exciting that I can look to the Word of God to give me all the instructions I need for living my life from day to day. And the Holy Spirit will confirm it and operate through me when I'm doing that. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Praise the Lord. And then Jesus warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. He wasn't ready for that revelation to go beyond the apostles. Because people... We're thinking that when Messiah comes, he's going to be the old conquering king. He's going to turf out the Romans. Well, they had to learn something else about the Messiah, didn't they? Because the revelation that they hadn't quite got hold of was the revelation that before he came as the old conquering Messiah, he must come as the suffering servant of the Lord. Hallelujah. But isn't it exciting that we're called to warfare? And that we have no choice in the matter. If you're anything like me, you don't like to hear that. Anything for a quiet life. But as we've been hearing, we are in the midst of foes that hate us, that want to destroy us. How are we going to cope with it? By being the church that Jesus is building. Amen. Living stones fitted together, having the rough edges all chipped away, as we were sharing earlier, and the master builder fitting us together. Do you know that the Lord Jesus is referred to in the Gospels as the carpenter and the son of the carpenter, isn't he? But the Greek word tectone means something more than carpenter. What does it mean? It means a mason. Not a Freemason, a stone mason. Someone who works with stone. So the Lord Jesus was not only a carpenter, he was a stone mason. He built homes for people. Now Nazareth was only a tiny, tiny hamlet in New Testament times. But Joseph and sons 
master builders of Nazareth was a sizable company. So where could they work? Because there weren't that number of houses that needed repairing in Nazareth, or people that needed new homes in Nazareth. So the likelihood is that they moved out further afield. And when Joseph died, Jesus was the head of the family, so he and James and their other brothers, they were part of the family that were master builders of Nazareth. But there is a place close by that in Jesus' day was a new town. Herod Antipas had his headquarters there. And it's called what? Anybody know? Zippory. Or Sepphoris is the Greek name, but Zippory is the Hebrew name. And it really means bird's eye view. It's located on top of a very high hill. Great vantage point. But the point is, it was a new time in Jesus' day. New buildings were going up. Houses, municipal buildings. They needed builders. And so there's a high likelihood that the Lord Jesus actually worked on buildings in that time. And when we go there, it's tremendous to look at some of those houses from New Testament times. And you look at them, and if you're anything like me, your imagination runs riot. And you can almost see the wooden scaffolding poles all over some of these houses. And the Lord Jesus working on them. Well, you see, he's the master builder, isn't he? It's interesting. Once you're aware of this word and the fact that it means mason as well as carpenter, you see evidence of it all over the New Testament. Jesus building, building, building. And talking about buildings. And he was utterly fascinated by buildings. And the disciples said to him on one occasion when they were leaving the huge temple of Herod the Great in Jerusalem, look, Lord, how enormous these stones are. <laughs> and some of them were enormous. And in the Temple Mount itself, along the western wall, some of them are enormous. Huge stones weighing over 600 metric tons. And they said to Jesus, look at these huge stones. And you remember how he responded. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Because they didn't know the time of their visitation. He was foreseeing AD 70 and the destruction of the temple. But you see how they drew his attention to its stones. Why did they do that? Because they knew he was fascinated by them. I like to think when we're in Capernaum, I often say this and tell them about the friends that brought their friend who was an invalid to Jesus. And they couldn't get anywhere close, could they? Because the householder, whoever he was, had invited Jesus in. And there was this colossal crowd of people. You couldn't get anybody near the place. Jesus was in there, hemmed in by all these folks. These four friends come. They want to get their friend to Jesus and get him healed. There's faith for you. Where did they go? They went up on the roof, didn't they? And ripped the roof apart. Not difficult to do. Because roofs in Capernaum, for the most part, were made of timber beams with smaller twigs laid across the other way, covered over with dung and mud to make it clay, and it was so hard you could go up there and stamp around and jump up and down, and it wouldn't give way. But if you were determined, you could rip up that plaster roof, and if you were so minded, you could lower somebody down between the beams. And that's what these four friends did. Do you remember? Can you imagine the situation? He's looking around at the people and thinking to himself, oh my, how wonderful. This great crowd in my house, listening to Jesus, the great minister, the great healer, the great deliverer, and he's here under my roof. But he looks up at the roof. And suddenly he sees something falling, and he's thinking, oh my word, what's going on here? And then a great hole appears, and four grinning faces are looking down at him. You see, it's one thing to invite Jesus into your home. It's another thing to have your roof ripped off. <laughs> it's one thing to invite Jesus into your life. It's another thing to have him expose everything that can be exposed. Why? Because he wants to deal with it. Now that roof came off. 
But I can just imagine our blessed Lord saying to the guy, look, I know it's a problem, but just you wait. I'll hang around after I've dis dismissed the people and I'll mend the roof for you. I can just imagine him doing that because that's what he did. He was a builder. He was used to these things. And there's another instance. Do you remember when he's talking about a, a client? Somebody wants to build a tower and he says, look, if you want to build a tower, what do you do? You first do what? Sit down and count the cost of how you're going to get this tower built. Because if you run out of money halfway through, you're going to look a right at you, aren't you? And I can see the professional builder thinking there, because he must have had many instances where people said, we want this done or that done, and because they didn't count the cost, they ran out of money. That's what tends to happen. So you count the cost before you start to build. That's the point he's making. But you can see the businessman talking there because he had been used to that kind of situation. So here we have the Lord Jesus talking about the church that he's going to build. I don't know whether you're comfortable with that. I'm not. But I can't ignore the fact. We are called to spiritual warfare. We were in Caesarea for the Bible just three weeks ago. And um, I was holding forth, rather like I've been holding forth to you now, talking about the terrible demonic activity in the place and the, the gates of hell and all of that, and how wonderful that Peter had the revelation about the magnificence of the Messiah, Jesus the Son of God, in this terrible place where Jesus drives out all the evil. And I stopped, quick prayer, and suddenly a woman sank to her knees and began to sob and sob and sob. And I thought, oh my, the Lord has really met with her. So I went over towards her to say, can I pray with you? Can I talk with you? What's going on? And with that, she fell over on the ground went as stiff as a board, started to writhe on the ground, she started to retch and scream at the top of her voice. And those in the group, understandably, were aghast, looking at this manifestation of something that was beyond their understanding. That was true of some of them. Others doubtless had had experience, but they didn't rush forward, I have to say. <laughs> But you see how the Lord prepares you? All those years ago, ministering alongside Trevor, I knew what I was dealing with. And it was so wonderful to be able to kneel by the side of that lovely young woman and to minister deliverance to her in the name of Jesus, come out of her. It was about 10 minutes battling, but finally the spirits left her like a wet rag. She was absolutely exhausted. But she got up, went back to the coach, and went back to the hotel eventually. And we spoke to her just a couple of days ago, and she's absolutely full of joy because the Lord has delivered her. Now, isn't that a curious thing? You see, the reality of these things is going to be increasingly obvious. And if you are scared of spiritual warfare, you've got to get unscared pretty quickly. Now, I'm not saying that you're blasé about the situation and you say, oh, bring it on, Satan. I'm ready for you. No, but what I'm saying to you is this. You've got to be prepared. See, Jesus was continually confronting Satan plundering his kingdom, and what did he use to do it? A gift to the Spirit. Healing, plundering Satan's kingdom. Deliverance, plundering Satan's kingdom. <clears throat> Prophetic words, plundering Satan's kingdom. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. Fabulous gifts that Jesus expressed perfectly. And that is the ministry that you and I have. 
The ministry of Jesus let loose in the world through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, I don't have any gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's about time you woke up then. Because if you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, it is for ministry. It's not to make you a better Christian. It's not to make you more holy. That is the presence of the Holy Spirit in you. And that came on you and into you when you were born again. Hallelujah. But you see, you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So that you can express the ministry of Jesus through the gifts. And see people set free. Hallelujah. This is the glorious privilege we have, folks. But that's how Jesus attacked Satan's kingdom. That's how we do it. Well, then how did he defend himself against Satan's kingdom? When he was attacked by Satan, how did he defend himself? Anybody aware? The word, the written word. Can you think of the example? Of course you can. The temptation of the Savior in the wilderness. When he was led in the wilderness in order to be tempted by the devil. Strategy of the Holy Spirit, wasn't it? See? Jesus was tempted by Satan. And every single time he did, Jesus responded with the same three little words. It is written. Where? In the Hebrew Scriptures. You see, this is how he defended himself against Satan. How can we consider defending ourselves any other way? If that's how Jesus did it. Interesting, isn't it? <coughs> defending himself against the enemy. And what's fascinating is that having done so, it says, then the devil left him. Is there a little bit added on the end of that? Until what? Until an opportune time. In other words, the next opportunity. Did you have it in your mind that after the temptations were over, the devil retreated and wouldn't appear again before the crucifixion? No way. When do you suppose was the next opportune time? Split second later? I imagine so. He was tempting Jesus all the time. How do I know that? Because he tempts me all the time. And what does the writer to the Hebrews say? The Lord Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Hallelujah. Now that, that, that's so exciting, isn't it? You see how close it brings Jesus to us? We fight the same way he fought. We defend ourselves against Satan through confessing the word of God. Now Jesus didn't just recite scripture at the devil. He didn't just quote scripture at him. The devil is well aware of the scriptures. That's not going to do it. What Jesus did was he confessed the word. He was speaking the same as God has said in his word. What God says in his word became the confession of the Lord Jesus. He was living it totally and absolutely. Remember how he said, whatever the Father says, that's what I say. Whatever the Father does, that's what I do. You see, his life was totally in obedience to his heavenly Father's word all the time. He was living a life of confession confessing the word, him speaking what Father had said. That was his whole lifestyle, and it's got to be ours too. Berating Satan with verses of Scripture isn't what it's about. It is about living the life of truth. And then we have authority to confess the word. We were talking about the centurion. It was because he was under Caesar's authority that he had Caesar's authority. It's because our blessed Savior was under the authority of his Father that he had the authority of his Father. Now that, I think, is pretty clear. But it's the same for us. And as we submit to the authority of heaven, we discover 
that we have the authority of heaven. And we're able to release on earth what has already been released in heaven. See, this is the secret of plundering Satan's kingdom. We have an exciting time ahead of us, but we need to enter in. It's no good to sit on the touchline and say, well, it's all right for the lunatic fringe. Then what's inclined to get involved, let them get involved. And if Satan attacks them, let him attack them. You haven't got that privilege. We are all of us together in this thing. And this is why we need a new church. New? No. We need the old one. We need the Jesus church. The one that he promised to build. Because that church is going to be victorious. But only on our Lord's terms. I will build my church. Yes, that's true. But what's the foundation? Jesus himself. Jesus himself. Elevating Jesus as high as we possibly can through our continual obedience and our bringing glory to him and longing for his appearing. Is that your heart? Is that where you are as you come to this conference? You've been exposed to some pretty exciting things, but you've been exposed to some pretty demanding things. When we say, the three, the four of us, come out from among them and be separate, what are you going to do? Are you going to do it? Or are you going to sit there like birds in the wilderness and say, oh, well, we'll just, we'll just wait. We won't do anything. We don't want to upset anybody. Who are you going to upset? You were upset before Jesus? Surely not. And he's building his church in his own way. And we need to say, Lord Jesus, here am I. As for me and my house, so we're going to serve the Lord. <laughs> That's what a great warrior said, wasn't it? Dear old Joshua. He had it right, didn't he? Fighting talk. That's what the Bible has. Fighting talk. Don't forget, it's the first mention of church. And it's on the lips of Jesus. You can't add to that. And what does he say? I will build my church. And the authorities of hell will neither hold out against it or be able to overcome it. Now that's a church worth belonging to. Do you agree? Amen. Let's go for it. The Lord bless you. Amen.